This conference will now be recorded. Hello, I am audible. Hello. 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 Sir, it's audible. Okay, somebody can coordinate and say, okay, before I auto test my audio is clear to everyone. Somebody say yes, I can proceed. Okay, somebody, you are starting a meeting or I can start my presentation. Hello. 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 Yeah, sir, is it audible? Yeah. Sir, you can hear me. Can you hear me? Oh, can you hear me, sir? Shall I start? One minute, sir. I'm going to call you. Okay, okay, sir. ஒரிட்டி Yes, we all know nutrition is a critical part of health and development. Better nutrition is related to stronger immune system and lower risk of diseases and longevity. Combined with physical activity, diet can help to reach and maintain a healthy weight and reduce the risk of diseases and promote overall health. Multi-nutrition in every form present significant threats to human health today the world faces a double burden of malnutrition that includes both undernutrition and overweight especially in low and middle income countries biofortification is a process of increasing the bioavailability and the concentration of nutrients and their nutritional value this can be done either through agronomic means that means addition of nutrient efficient nutrients to the soil and enrich the grain by way of uptake 
or conventional selective breeding or through genetic engineering why of fortification differ from ordinary fortification because it focuses on making plant foods more nutritious as the plants are growing rather than having nutrients added to the foods when they are being processed this is an important improvement on ordinary fortification when it comes to providing nutrients for the rural poor who rarely have access to commercially fortified food as such bio fortification is seen as an upcoming strategy for dealing with the deficiencies of micronutrients in low and middle income countries in the case of iron world health organization estimated that bio fortification would help during the 2 billion people suffering from iron deficiency induced anemia modern agriculture has been largely successful in meeting the energy needs of poor populations in developing countries in the past 40 years agriculture research has placed increased production at its center however recently there has been a shift that agriculture must now not only produce more calories to reduce hunger but also more nutrient rich food to reduce the hidden hunger one in three people in the world suffer from hidden hunger caused by lack of minerals and vitamins in their diets which leads to negative health consequences bio fortification the process of breeding nutrients into food crops for a temporarily cost effective sustainable and long term means of delivering more micronutrients this approach not only will lower the number of severely malnourished people who require treatment by complementary interventions but also will help them maintain improved nutritional status moreover bio fortification provides a feasible means of reaching mal nourished rural populations who may have limited access to commercially marketed fortified food and supplements with the above points in view today's topic is very relevant in the context of nutrition and health now i with the with these few words i hand over the session to the guest speaker thank you thank you all yeah thank you very much i think you have covered the what is the basic of this topic as my voice is very clear and audible i hope audible sir okay so few instruction to the participant i think they can mute their mic as well as the video as long as the presentation is still going on once presentation is over and you can do this will help you over connecting through mobile or the low bandwidth internet it will help you to hear the properly what i am talking so keep your mic as well as video in mute conditions is it is it okay i think everyone is will agree with me okay good morning students and faculty members and others participants ladies and gentlemen so i am here myself mahalingam govindraj working here as a millet breeder so we are working so almost more than a decade in this area of biofortification so today the topic is given to me is the breeding by fortified crop cultivars for nutritional security this looks a very new topics but it has been is a old traditional way of doing things but with the improved precision tools and mechanism to measure the impact uh, through the breeding as well as in the crop production so before going to this topic i would attention make attention of the student friends please listen carefully and raise your questions at the end of the presentation which is really is burning to you or you want keen to know about this area so i'm not going to take it like in a, you know a theoretical class it's more of um, not dialogues not interactive but i'm giving the open space you can understand with example so few slides i cannot avoid because i'm focusing the audience is to and i should talk some of the genetics or some of the basic relevance to the topic so with this background i am starting my topics breeding by fortified crop cultivars for nutritional security
I hope everyone see the background of the slide. It's very fundamental and a traditional way of doing the farming, integrated farming. It's all talk about not only agriculture alone, it's also integrated farming with animals, nutrition, humans, and agroforestry, and climate. So with this, I would like to go back, go to the next slide. I think who is controlling? I am unable to change my slide. You are able to see? Okay. So before I'm going to actual topic, I should brief you about the Institute at International Crop Research Institute for the semi-arid tropics. It has been found in 1972, so more than 45 years old institute working in R&D on the trial and crops. So one of the major CGR center which focusing more than one crops and which contribute to global food security. The headquarter placed in India, that is in Hyderabad, where I'm sitting and talking to you. And there are eight other regional and country offices in Africa and other Asian countries. So this is what ICRISAT's main aim is to, is, you know, Borlaug said, and the, every part in the world is rights to have the food. There's a right. But we make one more step ahead. We believe all people should have the right to access the nutritious food, not just food as of calories and better livelihood. So with the focus of six mandate crop, three trial and cereal and three grain legumes, sorghum, pearl millet, finger millet as a cereal, groundnut, chickpea and pigeon pea as a grain legumes. So our mission, vision is very straightforward as a global team is looking forward to address for the last uh, several decades is prosperous, food secure and resilient and trial and tropics. So you can see the map which is red highlighted where the research bread gem plasm has been spread all over the year more than 45 years and these are all the number of cultivars has been released using such material. And representing the global dry land tropics and agriculture presents, although it's like a, largely focusing in Africa and Asia, but we are access to the rest of the world. The challenges are many, but I'm highlighting very few, which is relevant to my topic. You know, the climate change is a big culprit in current scenario, not only for the agriculture, for the whole humankind. The increasing the temperature and carbon dioxide is not only cuts the crop production, it's also the crop nutrient. So which is published in Nature two years before. And the prediction shows that by 2050, not only population is increasing in one side and on another side, you will have the larger portion of the cereal, which legume which has consumed globally, wheat, rice, maize, and soybean it's going to affect significantly its nutrition value. So the hunger map is coming up in more than 198 countries, which is very threatening, including in India, though we achieved on the historical record in crop production last year, 2019, many of you seen in the news. However, the nutrition is still unaddressed after the Green Revolution, which has produced huge amount of uh, the yield and input-oriented agriculture. Taking the success lesson from the Green Revolution, we are going to add the nutrition with the different types of uh, technology as well as tools. I hope everyone see the picture very clear. The top two is the human brain. So I would like to tell this story very short. You can see on your left hand side, the well developed nervous system in the brain, which is very much essential for the healthy child. And on the right hand side, you can see these two childs are born in the same day. And this you can see after five years, and this is the micro scanning shows that the another child which is access to very poor nutrition and the brain has then is not fully developed. So this is what the global more than 2 billion people affected by malnutrition but children and women are the most vulnerable group. And if you see the bottom so which is I'm trying to relate to what I'm doing as with a team this is the mineral dense grain. 
So this you can find out the red marks and the highlights. So this electron microscope, you can see these are all the metals, iron and zinc is accumulated in the germ bush in the pearl millet. So this is what I'm trying to connect to the global community, how important the grain, what you are eating as a food is very much related to your brain development in early stages. So this is not high, I just endorsing, it is endorsed by the World Bank in 2018 as an annual development report. They have the cover page published. So this is message is very strong enough to take it forward. <coughs> Sorry. So with that help of Harvest Plus, many of you know, you can search in our website and they have targeted many crops and but I'm highlighting here almost four, four plus four, eight crops. Each crops has been focused on specific nutrient. So iron beans, vitamin A, maize and zinc maize and iron palmillet and zinc wheat and vitamin cassava, sweet potato and zinc rice. So this are the crop has been focused currently with the funding from various donors, multinational. If you see the, the globe, how the nutrition spread, two billion people is not only iron deficiency or anemic, but they are also vitamin <coughs> deficiency. By looking this uh, app, you can find that the variant intensity and the degrees of the malnutrition spread across the ma global map is indicates is more towards the developing countries. But some country has more than one problem. For example, you can see anemia and stunting. You can see India and some Saharan Africa, Central Africa, and including Southeast Asia is the target countries one has to address the twin burden of this problem. Coming to India, very narrow down. So what is anemia, what is stunting? Anemia cost more than 50% is from come from iron deficiency, hemoglobin. So where does in standing come from the zinc deficiency where you don't grow as for example, at the age, what's supposed to height you supposed to have. So these maps indicates, this is the data from the uh, government of India, National Family Health Survey, which is available once in 10 years. So this is the latest data available after 2016. If you see red, orange and green, you can indicate that high, low, medium. But however, as a researcher, I can see the entire India should be in red. The low you can see 48%. Is 48% almost two person, one in two, you are having malnutrition. So it doesn't mean that the green is has its escape. So that's why I'm telling every state has to be monitored and has to be taken very high priority measures of addressing the malnutrition, especially in the children and five year old and adolescent girls and women. So what's the strategies available so far to address is the new strategy we're dividing? Yes, we are trying to approach the new device is tools and technology. However, government has been putting place in a lot of intervention for the last few decades. For example, supplementation. You all know about the very well example of polio and iodine salt. So for as a part of fortification and supplementation, your prevention. And the far most important way of addressing malnutrition is the diet diversity, which is impossible in the monopoly or the monocrop growing culture, which we have been following in the last few decades. So what's an alternative approach is available to give the best of solution and to the vulnerable group is crop biofortification. And I think as student friends, you should differentiate by definition, all these four interventions are aiming the same goal, but by definition, the approaches are different. So biofortification refers to is the improvement of the genetically inherent potential of the plant or crop varieties to accumulate more micronutrients or minerals into the edible parts of the plant, either any parts of the plant, but it should be edible, which can have the measurable impact on human health. It's not just you increase in one crop variety, which does not have the impact on after your consumption. So this is the whole value chain package. So, but today I'm going to give the entire view 
uh, in a very brief manner. So why I'm telling is, and biofortification is, is almost a decade old a technology, but well forward. Many people, you know, green revolution happens because of the hungry. Yes, the hungry made us to make a green revolution it to be happen. So poverty is a burden of revolution. Everyone know. So malnutrition also is, you know, very close to the poverty group. So that's why we are linking this technology to the vulnerable group. So there could be confusion among the students. What is fortified and biofortified? Sometimes, yeah, I said in already, these are all the two different approach, but target the same. So it by look, it is different, but it's complement each other. Fortified is after your first harvest. After you harvest anything you add to fortify, it's become fortified. So biofortified, you are making the genetic modification in which in generation after generation, you will get the trait after the planting. But whereas fortification one has to do repeatedly to ensure those micronutrients are available. So this is well established in Crop Science Society of America and also American Society of Agronomy. So the definition and difference are well captured. On the right side, you are looking for the uh, instrument, which is a very robotic kind of things, and which is really supporting us to make a rapid analysis of micronutrient. So I would like to show the video. I hope you are able to see a few two minutes video. If. Okay. So, so this is the background uh, what we have started already. But some of some of the people you have questions how the agriculture going to help the 
the nutrition reduction among the society as the people are looking alternative for the nutrition source. So you can see on your left side, you can see that what before the biofortification intervention has been happened, supplementation and fortification trying to cover up almost 40%, where the 60% come from the agriculture supplies. However, once you introduce the biofortification strategy, which is access to generation after generation, you can reach up to 80% of the agriculture-based intervention where you can supplement and fortification can be reduced as both cost as well as the scale. So this is how the hypothesis are proposed and are being working in many countries. And many people know uh, I'm not trying to take an advantage of to connect this situation, but it's very pathetic to hear and people forgetting the basic understanding. I'll talk about the immune system nowadays. The immune system relies on some few vitamins and minerals. So what I'm trying to say here is this micronutrient not only just to reverse your illness, but however, to prevent your illness in the future. So this is how the RDA, the daily recommended allowance of each nutrition as a threshold for everyone of us, including me and you. So one has to meet this recommended allowance as a minimum standards for iron or zinc or whatever the essential micronutrient and vitamins. When close to the sub-sufficiency, it's okay, you can recover up to here. But if you go to the very severe deficiency, that makes the severe infection of any, any foreign organism. So that's why keep optimum level of micronutrients very essential through the various restriction. So this is how we are connecting, which is has been already published in in just a few months back in nutrient channels. It is very much connected to the immune system of this micronutrient and working very well to risk reduction for the many virus and bacterial infection as the immune system. And many people wonder. For next 25 to 30 years, how the globe is going to have is 7 billion people and we are not going to escape out of that, but how the people are distributed, if you see the next generation people is almost 2 billion people, they are too young and they are also, and you can see out of 7 million people, only 1.4 billion people are going to supply the entire food production. And this is only optimistic. There could be a pessimistic way that could be reduced or maybe increased. It depends upon the future, availability of the waters and resources and financial of the farmers community. So when it comes to these next generation, it's very key and fundamental to keep them in more diverse, nutritious, and many people are working towards the application or maybe delivered kind of tools is very good today. However, the next generation population is go and narrow thinking of technology, which is more technology dependent. So which may be the vulnerable in future situation, which should be avoided. If you see the population, India and China is like two eyes of the body. So equally has the population for next 25 to 30 years. And there could be other countries, but it is smaller in population. Being arable land, <coughs> arable land is reduced for the production of the stable foods. One has to use the arable land more judiciously to produce energy as well as the nutrition. So coming to this, I would I given an example of interactive map. I think you people can access the website and you can go and select the country. It will be available, the interactive map, how bad or how good in addressing the micronutrient and where you should invest top priority, high priority and low, and there could be no sum of places. So this indicates the donors as well as the government organization to emphasize what type of intervention they can help and what type of crop they can select. There will be three questions always asked, not now, in the past, when this inception of biofortification. is very fundamental, one has to address these three questions, unless otherwise you can't succeed.
Number one is, is it possible to breed plant with minerals and vitamins, which is available generation after generation after farmers keeping the seed and growing? The second question is, will the minerals and vitamins be bioavailable to human body after consumption? The third is, is really farmers looking nutritious variety rather than high yielding variety alone is not bothered about nutrition which is not visible and which don't have the any premium price in the market. I think my rest of the presentation will bring you a direct as well as an indirect answer to three questions. So number one is the country priority, how this has been done. So you can see based on the crops, the crops ranked in the different nutrition and the scale of production. If you see the top three crops, if you take the iron and zinc, if you take the zinc in particular country, you can see out of 128 countries, this rank third. Only way of agriculture if you want to do based on the crops. Number three is the wheat. You can fortify with zinc. Whereas pearl millet out of 117 countries, it ranked 10th whereas India and Africa can be focused. Similarly, the rest of the crops. So this indicates the priority has been done is very detailed study and based on the very strong inputs from the various disciplines, including the medical doctors. And one can ask the question, how the nutrition levels are fixed in the crop breeding when you are targeting the biofortification? As I said, it was very well discussed over the decade and many crops has been reached at the target level. But for example, you can see pro-vitamin A in sweet potato as well as maize. This is the baseline. They are having the final target additional is 15. So when you are looking for the basic, you have to think about RDA, which as I explained in the previous slide, the daily recommended elements of essential micronutrient one has to take into consideration and as well as how much quantity of the per capita available for the particular commodity or the crop you are using as a stable food. Per day, if you are consuming around 350 to 400 gram of rice, that has to be taken into account and what level of micronutrient to meet your RDA in daily basis. That's how these values are arrived. So for example, rice, you can have the baseline as 16 ppm and whereas you are going to target additional 12 ppm and total product and the end product should have 28 ppm. Then only as I said in the definition, micronutrient increasing the micronutrient in edible part is not our target. It has to meet your daily RDA at least minimum 30% and the rest will come other sources. This is how it's built and you can see it's different crops here, how much variation has been reported. There is fantastic natural variation is available, whereas there is no availability <clears throat> of the variation. One can look for the biotechnology approach or trans transgenics and introgression of such traits from the relevant species. So the process I'm telling very briefly, there's no need to go into detail. At this stage, I think you may not be interested, but I'm as a wider group of the audience. So I thought of giving the overview. This has been classified into three categories. One is the discovery phase. Discovery phase which set everything is ready, logistic, baselines, targets, everything. The next one is the development stage. The development stage is a pre-breeding and crop improvement, crop development, testing and everything. The third one is the delivery. The delivery is a very important testing at farmer field as well as the G by interaction and varietal multiplication to reach the farmer fields. So three segment which covers the entire discipline, it's called economics, plant breeder, multidisciplinary partnership. However, the start relay with the plant breeding team and socioeconomics team, which is very much important. So this are all some example. I'm not going to cover each crop, but I'm giving some few example what traits are targeted and which countries. The zinc rice, India and Bangladesh. And orange maize for Africa. I hope India is not accepting orange maize. People are growing the yellow maize. Zinc wheat in India and Pakistan. And iron and zinc sorghum in India and Africa. 
so there is a formulate i run as well as seek i will coming in the later slides so as i indicated student friends are participating in this meeting i would like to give a few example maybe it will provoke their the subject area so any breeding program is relies on the trait genetics if you want to select what type of breeding program or breeding methods you want so you need to understand what type of genetics in, involved in that trait buildup. So most of the micronutrient iron and zinc, and sometimes the pro-vitamin A, is all our polygenic controls. Polygenic means more than one genes, and it is quantitatively inherited, not qualitative traits. Qualitative traits is just like color or the smell, which you cannot have the normal distribution, continuous variation. So this is called is a polygenic quantitative trait, all this micronutrient. And someone asks what type of quantitative traits? There are two group of major group of quantitative traits. One is additive quotient and another one is a non-additive. So additive quotient is largely is directly linked to, to the polygenic inherent, which is more than one gene or few genes. And it's very much related to the very heritable portion of mother to progenies or it also helps the repeatability which help you to identify stability of them trait as well as the progenies the heritable question the heritability is involve a lot of additive genetic variants if we see the right side the phenotype is component of two things only genotypes otherwise environment we can't control the environment but we can understand and try to control the genotype factor to assess our trials as well as to understand our traits of genetics. The genotypes has indicated additive or non-additive. So additive portion I already explained, non-additive is mostly is a dominance, other than additive genes is a dominance. And there will be interaction between the additive as well as the dominance, which is gene interaction. You will be most of the undergraduate students may be studying the final year of fluoride uh, BSc agriculture or maybe in the postgraduate. The additive dominance is very, very, very fundamental to understand if somebody would choose the genetic is a favorite topic. If you see the white and red, the additive because it's for example white is governed by one gene and red is governed by another gene but at a single gene but if your additive portion if you see is intermediate it's not this and not this it's intermediate it's a mixture of both so that indicates that the many genes are involved but as the dominant you can see the traits are dominant here in the case red it was found that then it is very much clearly indicated your F1 will be having the dominant expression. If this is what generally understood, any disease resistant or insect resistant, found to be dominant, very easy to breed and express in the hybrid. In case of variety, the dominant don't work. We look after the additive variants. So coming to the next, the GPA interaction, the global severity tracking is very much important as part of the interaction. So play key role in the trait determination, as I told, one has should not be biased, excluding this. So one has to understand the environment and their interaction, which is called G by E. So always the nutrient is much more stable in this case because which is relevant to the topic is always stable than yield. People are referring and targeting the yield. So one can blindly go with more stability than yield. And some of the studies are reported. There was a negative effect on yields, the nutrition which you are building, but not always. So people should understand very clearly that could be possible. You are developing the correlation with this already developed variety, which is bred for yield, not for nutrition or not for both. When you are targeting the association or correlation study, where you are bringing the both traits, then this correlation negative effect won't be there. So this is kind of you know biased estimate, as a as research team should understand. Even if there is a negative effect, there is a way to nullify. If you plant a large number of population, instead of 100 plant, you plant 500 plant, you can easily eliminate 
the negative effect. A very high genetic variation available, high genetic variation in the genes, germplasm, and the level of magnitude of variation is very friendly available in most of the crops. And nowadays people are understanding the genomics and there are major QTLs are available. Not one QTL, there are many QTL because this are additive in position are identified for these traits. There is a marker, SNP marker, single nucleotide polymorphism, which is the most relevant and robust marker system currently working. Uh, it's are also identified for both micronutrient in F2. So why I'm telling F2? F2 is a segregation population where one cannot go and screen the population and after the adult gland. So if one can take the DNA sample at seedling stage and you can screen the marker, whether marker presents, yes, your traits are there. Very simple mechanism. So breeding approach is very straightforward as many of them are uh, uh, relevance to the reproductive stage of the crop, uh, reproductive system of the crop cell pollinated crops and cross pollinated crops. The pure name selection used to show and since I told many things are additive in nature and this selection based strategy will work. Whereas hybrid era we are working and the predigree breeding is much more important where you have to select individual plant with the traits of interest. In cross pollinated crops population improvement is a wonderful natural gift to keep your gene for free. However, the pedigree breeding is the most successful one in cross-pollination as one can handle large number of population or crosses and in towards the making the hybrid as their only cultivar option today. So hybrid breeding as I indicated, dominant traits are there, you can go with it, hybrid breeding. If you are non-dominant, that is additive, it's very easy. You can select both parent that trait should be there. If it is dominant, that trait only one parent it pushes the trait, it your job is done. So this is what the population in frontiers in genetics oh, sorry uh, this year and you can see the schematic diagram which approaches very straightforward. For example here we are given folate if you see you are screening the germplasm if your variation is available you can go conventional method and one can also approach the marker estate selection. If this is no, then one has to approach the genetic engineering approach. So this is what I stage discovery, development and delivery. So this is very fundamental way of explanation how this process are taken place. So now I'm going to highlight and not much in subject in detail, but what has been done in biofortification across the globe in the mini CG center, uh, here is comes the zinc wheat. My colleagues will be working in Simit, Mexico, and he shared this slide for to present. So by a fortified wheat, you know the size of Southeast Asia, but the wheat is largely grown in Pakistan and India. So that's why the target is here. Already, this is what tested many varieties and it is are being grown in farmer's field. I hope everyone remember the three questions I have displayed in the beginning of my presentation. So here come, you will get some answer relevant to this. So how the variation is captured, you can see how the grain yield. It's not only micronutrient blindly we are adding. So we are taking enough care to keep the yield potential <coughs> Otherwise, you cannot sell into the market or your partners won't free food until you don't get a government premium price or premium market. So you have to keep both yield as well as nutrition in your target product, either hybrid or varieties. So this is how the gradually is moving, you know, as well as yield as well as the micronutrient. So when it comes to the genetic potential of the germplasm or introgression line or using the wild species in the primary gene pool, and you can see there are some of the gene pools are available with the greater magnitude of micronutrient in grain zinc and both grain iron and zinc in wheat. And sometimes you know it's geographical nature where the crop has been grown. And this role, the area has been spread so far, wheat and Mexico and Pakistan and India. And there are some testing is going on China. 
So it will be coming up. This is the variety names in each year what has been released in particular geography. So this address that farmers are accepting. And whereas in pro vitamin A, uh, this is my colleague Dr. Prasanna shared this line. And you, you see the vitamin rich A as well as the zinc cultivar has been released across the globe, Latin America and Eastern and Central and Southern Africa and Southeast Asia and South Asia. So this very clearly indicate that is potentially working this technology and people are growing and consuming these cultivars without and negotiating or without compromising your yield in cost. So Pajra, you know, I think is Paul Millet in Tamil is Kampu. So it is very much a traditional crop, but I forget for many years, but it has been still growing almost eight to nine million hectares in India. India is the number one producer. So you can see this crop has been fixed 71 ppm as a target that has been 100% reached. So we were breeding this crop for the last 10 years as myself is in charge. So we delivered almost 10, nine hybrids, one variety in India. So more than one lakh household families are being accessed to these varieties. And this is very much relevant to the, this is the map I already shown, but you can see the production. The areas drastically declined, but the production is kept very high. So still we come from 13 million hectares to 8 million hectares, but production is retained. That's how the yield potential is maintained. Some of the variability, as I said, jam plasm. You can see this is the mainstream means it's a traditional way of breeding where you don't have much micronutrient higher levels. Whereas the commercial cultivar, none of them are qualified, which are only calorie built, no micronutrients. Whereas jam plasm, do you have? Yes, we have, but we are not explored. But by a fortification approach, explore the jam plasm and brought almost 98% of your material on the marginal and able. So this is how we are doing. I take this at is a large number of plant crosses as well as the scrap it screen. And this is a manual operator. This is a ro robotic system. One can handle easily 300 sample per day. And remember, handling with cross pollination, you can see the photo where the women and men are working. How many plants we have to maintain the genetic integrity is a huge job. But it's all about how you maintain the precision to develop to integrate your traits. So so far, more than two lakhs entry sample has been screened in India, and this is the one of the largest sample screening in the world. So variation and heritability are indicated. I'm just showing an example which has one of my student published in this uh, paper in Springer. So you can see the variation how 35 milligram per kg and you have almost 3.5 milligram per 100 gram and you will have 11.6 milligram per 100 gram. The huge variation two to three times. So which give you uh, is a fantastic way of exploring the genetic potential to breed you know your target level. So we also curiosity, we screen the material for protein content. You can see almost double and triple level of variation available with a mean of 11% of protein. So basically we are not losing any of the agronomic traits which is prepared by the farmers, either large seed or the high yield potential. So all we need to keep the integrity of these traits. And the principal component analysis, I think you no know, need to worry about the technology, but I'm trying to explain to the <coughs> sorry, common people. This is how the grouping of material has been done based on the traits. If you see the all the three micronutrient and protein has come in one group. So you, each segment is one group. So all the yield related traits, granule, panicle, grip, and seed white come closer. Flowering and panicle length are different. <coughs> this indicate 
more than 50% of the variation is determined by this two principal component, which easily can distinguish your traits of interest from your study material. And also the diversity analysis, which my students published. So we found that more than 28E, which an inbred line, which is hybrid parent, you can see more than 10 cluster, almost 10 cluster based on the micro unit, and which indicates that we have R line, which is restored, very important for hybrid breeding, both R and B line, and whereas the population progenies, as well as the gemplasm progenies. So you have diverse of material with diverse of genetics. So it is very good to explore the biofortification in millet. So this is one of our hybrid released and two years back. It's grown in former field now, very high yield, as well as the high iron material. There are many other hybrids has been released and also, you know, moved to Africa. So now they are having pumper harvest. And one has to understand your, we are increasing yield 5 to 10% as per the national requirement as the cultivar release policy. <clears throat> However, we are not negotiating the micronutrient diversity. So you can see one, uh, one can see we are almost reaching the 100%. So this is how the marketing has been done in India as well as in Africa. And this is all I said more than 1,100,000 1, people has been reached in India as well as in Africa. So Africa, when we release this variety, is a huge demand. So you can see the woman farmer with a huge harvest and she's supplying the material for the Cirilla. Many people are, know the young, young children are fitted with this type of Cirilla, even in India. So this is made from biofortified pearl millet and it is specific product in, from Nestle. It's working very well. I think in future it will be coming to India as well. So this is the woman uh, uh, self-help group and this is our donor from Washington DC and they are seeing the real impact what's happening in the ground. So that's why I told the three question, the three question is very important for trust through the breeding as well as the seed production. So sorghum, you know, so sorghum also is there are a lot of potential and there has been baseline and one variety of Sakti has been released. So this has a lesser micronutrient, but it is having high yield potential. And women especially, they have very good making chapati and roti in Maharashtra and Karnataka. So this is very much useful for them to prepare the household food system for the nutrition requirement. So what is available? So why we are making this biofortification into business? In the breeding business is very simple. You can see this is the cranial target, which is so far is targeted. And this is the micronutrient target, which we are trying to introduce into the breeding system. If you see, these are all the varieties so far released, hybrid release so far released in India, which has micronutrient around 40, 45. Some are having high, but this has been not growing. But if you see the biofortified variety, which has been started last five to eight years, it's gradually moving towards the target level of nutrition. But our aim is to lift up to here to meet the yield potential. It's a very simple and logistic and feasible strategy trying to advocate on the mainstreaming of the biofortification. So someone asks us as, as the staff or the researcher may ask whether I grow the biofortified pearl millet in Tamil Nadu or I can grow in Rajasthan is that the field productivity level is going to affect the micronutrient level significantly. Yes, it's not systematically. For example, this is the micronutrient level on our y-axis and you see in x-axis you have the word your field how much can yield 1.5 tons to 6 tons per hectare. So assume that the same variety I see as 1301 more than 40 sites has been evaluated. There is no statistical reduction. It's, there is no systematic correlation. So one can harvest even two tons with 90 or even 100. Tons. But you can also harvest at six tons with the 90. So it doesn't have any influence on your field level productivity as long as your soils are 
adequate in micronutrient. It should not be deficient. So this testing has been done only adequate soil nutrition is available. So coming to yield as well as the nutrition, you see there are two ways of seeing the correlation. One is a yield per se as well as the, the micronutrient per se. If you see there was no correlation, sometimes you can see zinc is most essential. Many farmers are spraying zinc-based chemical to boost the yield. So that means these two micronutrients are very much important to boost the grain yield at farmer field as well, including the early stage of seeding establishment. And as per the breeding community, you know, as I said, additive variants, you can gradually improve the generation after generation as, as a plant generation. I'm referring here, F1 to F4, F5, F6, F7. You can gradually increase your level of micronutrient. So someone asked from the nutrition team or food science team, whether your product after harvest has has advantage over the other normal product is that your balanced amino acids changed something are still retaining the same quality of the product we have compared it and also published right now so you can see this non-biofortified gray color this is biofortified you can see always advantage over the normal product for the essential amino acid breakdown and you will wonder that it almost everything is higher except when trip to fan so we can see this is the complete balance amino acid available in this crop after biofortification. For the interest of the student, I would like to highlight this is the genomic study we have done using the TAR sequel markers. You can see the 9, 7 chromosome and 12 millet, you know, 14, 2N number 14, but you will get 7 QTL region. This is the distribution of our markers, it's 10,000 plus. So you, you will get how this more than that. So this is our distribution, how the marker number of markers, so more than 30 markers in the green segment. This is to indicate how the marker for iron and zinc distributed across the genome it is very much important to understand. As I told, and we have seen the earlier slide also, the portion of the seed where you are accumulating also, you should understand because many grains are processed. It should not be lost during the process. So that's why I'm telling it, it has to be built in a whole package of practice and also including the various discipline to understand how the strategy is going to work at the consumer level as well as the farmer's level. So we are very well aware and just a few examples. You can see we are taking enough care where the micronutrient is accumulated and how we are selecting. And coming to the market strategy, though it's, it's not my core area, but our colleagues in a, uh, Brazil as well as uh, in Colombia, they are doing how they are doing. This is how they're promoting the sweet potato and orange sweet potato marketing. Whereas in Asia, we still we rely on type of group meeting and large farmers gathering. And nowadays we are going with some extra species, uh, zinc based uh, hata made from the biofortified varieties. Whereas in Africa, I think part of India is more famous to Hollywood or Hollywood, but Africa is too. So they are also enjoying with these three film has been released for the biofortified varieties, with the famous uh, superstar in their regions, as well as the musician. So how they are promoting uh, this technology to the public. And as I indicated, Serlac already started. There is a high iron being already started in Brazil as well as uh, in Colombia. So this is how you can see the maize, orange maize, as well as normal maize seed pack is in Godown is maintained to easily track your seed production as well as the procurement. It's a very simplest way of done in Uganda for the bio, bio fortified maize variety. I hope everyone remember my last question is farmers is accepted. Yes, you can see more than 60 countries now all the crops has been grown. This is the map will indicate how the farmers are accepted, the biofortified varieties. Another question is still, you know, the bioavailability is a key. All the crop has been studied. I'm focusing here pearl millet. 
the more than six months intervention, there are seven studies has been done and five studies has been published in Journal of Nutrition with clinical num registration number. The variety supplied from our team, <coughs> Dharna Shakti and ICMH 1201 You can see the school-based uh, study shows 80% we targeted uh, only more than 30%. The surprise comes to us when you consume 300 gram of adult, 150 to 200 gram for children. You will meet 100% of your zinc RDA, 80% of RDA for adult for air. So this is a wonderful news to the policy makers. One can introduce the midday meal scheme. And this is not needed. I think just for a shake of interest I'm presenting. This is how we are planning to how integrated by a fortified market should grow. And as when I'm childhood, my mother used to make not all of these, a few of these, but I'm still I'm unable to give to my kids. So this is not forgotten, and we are looking more towards the energy calorie based foods. I think many of you people should try this type of product from your own native crops. That is very much important. That's why we are talking about the nutrition today. As I told you, cyclists are making smart food initiative and very three mantras. Number one is good for you. Second is good for the farmers because it's not disturbing untapped potential. There is a lot of variability and good for the planet when you are talking about climate change. So with this, this is very much important to know how to differentiate your crop. For example, millet has can provide one hectare of land <coughs> almost one tons, which can support energy for four, four adults and 15 adults for one year for their iron and zinc requirement. Whereas rice, energy will supply 20 adults, but it can only survive for a seven adult per micronutrient, even though it consume 500 gram per day. But it's possible only because of ill potential. If you increase here, four tons per hectare, and you can double, triple the supplies. What I'm going to say, we no need to replace the rice with any alternate crop, but one has to understand if you need the nutrition, one has to choose the right crop for the consumption. Uh, I'm almost closing my presentation, uh, but many of you know this building, very uh, famous building as a political side. As a citizen, we are looking forward to the decision come from this building. But I'm trying to connect based on the publication. And one of my colleagues is working at Harvard University. He's published and uh, it's Economic Political Weekly. And this is very much relevant to the connecting the poverty as well as the malnutrition to the EMP uh, site that is a member of parliament constitution. If you do that, <clears throat> we have almost captured all the MP area in all the states. If you see, if you take for the Indian National Congress by 40 wise, this will indicate percentage, how much percentage you are having the malnutrition 30%. So one has to talk to them and potentially you can improve for this their MP to knowledge your area is more malnutrition. This is one way of supporting the society to address the malnutrition. So next, the key message. You know, malnutrition is, is not the a defect by birth. It is induced by the system or the food system. The standing anemia is highly preventable. So by a fortified crops, is target the root cause of the nutrition problem. I said fortification is a short term, genetic fortification is for long term, and it is for sustainable. So benefiting the farmers as well as the consumer is somebody making nice.
Pond Beach as well as I'm audible. Yes. So with that, I thank the audience. If you have any burning question, I'm very happy. Hello. So thanks for in uh, your listening. So I'm trying to address any question if you have related to this topic. I hope I'm not covered the entire thing. I'm trying to engage you all this one hour at most 45 minutes. I am Hello. Very good morning, sir. I am Kamal Raj from second year. Hi, good morning. And I have a question to ask to you, sir. Sir, yeah. in India, which state started the first cultivation of biofortified crops? And uh, also, is it possible to add the micronutrients to the crop through fertilizers? Uh, which fertilizer is responsible for adding the micronutrient to the crops, sir? Okay, I hope I understood your question. Mm. So I understand your question is that what is the first biophotovoltaic variety grown in India? And the second part of your question is what type of micronutrient fertilizer can be used to economically fortify the crops? So I'm yes, sorry, your first, I'm right? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, answering your first question is, I'm not claiming this is first or second, but as per the knowledge, if he, if someone know that there is uh, lysine and uh, the maize has already released so many protein variety, copic protein genes. If you see biofortified, any micronutrient or vitamins incorporated in the cultivar is the biofortified. But as far as the biofortification program we have released in India, pearl millet is the first one to release the first variety in the 2012. Coming to the, I think many people are uh, having enthusiastic questions. Looks like everyone unmuting their mute. I please wait. I'm I'm postponing my meeting for next half an hour, so I can address most of your question. So. Second part of your question is aim is for COVID to the sustainable way, but however, somebody want to get uh, application through micronutrient, so one can choose this foliar spray or the soil application. Both, I think not one is going to help. You have to apply both soil as well as the foliar at the critical stage of the crop where the flowering or grain filling stage at the establishment stage in the soil application. You have to go, i not specific, mostly the zinc based fertilizer or iron based fertilizer. So that's very recommended, but it's not sustainable way of practicing to advise the farmers because that will increase their burdens to input oriented cost. But once you buy the seed, which is biofortified, it keeps the genes and genetics intact, seed after seed. That's the communication. Thank you. A pleasant morning, sir. I'm Tulasi Sairam from second year. Yeah. My doubt is that genetically modified crops and biofortified crops are same or different. What's the difference? So biofortified, I said, it includes everything. Either you do conventional way of uh, genetic recombination or the artificial, what you are referring the gene from other species. It includes both as a part of biofortification, but genetically modified is still is a separate wing, which is not of as of today, is not of biofortification. But 
that is only to understand or to show the technology to the community it can be possible where you, you don't have the trade variation for example one are looking for the iron thing from the same crops gem blossom when you are not able to access the high level then you are looking for alternative and that approach you can look for the genetically biofortified that is still you cannot release as for the release policy or testing policy in india or many countries so as long as the release policy is handicapped and we cannot go as long as so far released variety from biofortified is only through conventional method i hope i answered your question yes sir okay thank you thank you Good morning, sir. I'm from Rajshagar, from second year. Yeah, Rajshagar, tell me. Sir, uh, my uh, my question is, uh, our uh, yeah, as we all know, our ancestors have a lot of uh, micronutrients foods in the past times, mm -hmm. but they don't have any other uh, scientific cultivation or any other uh, new varieties. But they have higher micronutrient crops. But uh, nowadays we have so many cultivation practices, uh, so many technologies available, but we don't have any crop like that. We are developing so far and so far. Uh, is there any problem in uh, gene modification or is there any problem in our cultivation practices? Uh, this is all about you and me <clears throat> when it comes out of house, how we dress it. And you can imagine how we dressed at the year age old 10 years old and how we dress and maybe 30 years old so there's a dressing sense or the eating habits or the quantities how it changed so this is how the cultivation practice as well as is over time has its own uh, driven based changes what they are looking for the income through farming as long as you are looking only for your consumption I hope every farmer will reserve their land for their small vegetable for their home consumption. Whichever they are targeting for the market, they go with uh, high yielding varieties. So the yield is linked to the income. So it is all agriculture related to the income that drives your nutrition is ignored. But it is not to comply someone or the system but one can rebuild the nutrition along with the needs of the yield but that's what we are linking we have no need to compromise what color you want what taste you want and how much yield you want on top of it we are adding the micronutrient that's it that's the reason why we are not focused it's many country many states of india is growing by fortified varieties as zinc wheat as well as maize, sorry, maize is not still not in field, as pearl millet and wheat. Rice also in Bangladesh and in coming in India already started. So this we wait and see next to maybe a maximum for five to six years and this type of cultivar will flood like anything. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Greetings, sir. I am S. Christopher Josephal from first year. Sir, I have a doubt. Is there any possibility of a registering of parent character in future generations, sir? Parent means hybrid parents, you are referring? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's what. Uh, well, selecting so far, we are selected for grain yield rights or plant height or maybe yield potential disease resistant insect resistant so now we are adding one more trade package uh, so that's a micronutrient so one has to select the parent after tick marks all these traits are available then it will be taken into consideration that's why i explained in my son of the slide if we want to go through the hybrid breeding it depends upon the genetics of the trait if it is dominant is one parent is enough you no need to target two parents if it is additive in nature you have to bring those traits in both parent male as well as female then only you can meet the mid parent heterosis so this is how you have to one has to decide you have to bring both parent or one parent for the target traits of course parent is very important you have to build the traits in parents thank you sir
anyone good morning sir i am jennifer from third year yeah tell me sir is there any awareness about the bio fortification among the farmers in tamil nadu and the government has taken a step to that yeah. yes there are a lot of awareness going at the university level i think tamil nadu agriculture university already is taking the variety they are already multiplying i hope everyone know the millet mission uh, launched by central government across the state as well as the nutrition mission um and there are many other mission mode project which is only targeting 50% of the seed multiplication only through the bio fortified varieties many people has been aware that the nutri farm launched by ms swami nathan has also taken into consideration this bio fortified variety so that's why so i'm telling this is just a very infant stage once you release any variety or hybrid it has to take at least 3 to 4 year to reach the farmer field as through the national seed system but as a document as a approach as a intervention every government or the state university or the research community is well aware and for the farmers we are trying to communicate maximum through the news channels as well as the newspapers and various meetings and we are trying our best but specific to tamil nadu it is it's a, it is restricted to the state agriculture university it comes with the host control uh, this knowledge sharing platform so this still it depends upon the state agriculture university thank you sir thank you okay students hello sir i am abhirami from second year hi students i would like to express my sincere appreciation to all of you who generously helped us to make this event to become success thank you each and every one for being here with us today thank you sir and thank you students thank you to all participants yeah thank you very much for listening comms listening <clears throat> i hope how much relevant uh, i don't know how much relevance to your area of study but however is a new area one can explore and to understand through internet as well as publication available one can log in to ecrisat and go to the publication you can find a lot of information related to this i hope this time is not enough to ask everyone's question but i am very happy to access the question through email if sometime i find it i can respond all the best for your graduation and take care and stay home and be healthy thank you thank you sir thank you so much thank you